We've uh, titled this session, All Eyes on Asia, Perspectives from Our Allies, and we're very honored to have Congressman Randy Forbes, uh, who has agreed to moderate this session. Uh, Congressman Forbes, as uh, Bill said at the end of the last session, is a real leader uh, on national security issues in the House, and also especially on issues related to Asia. Uh, he's a founder and chairman of the Congressional China Caucus, and I'm going to turn it over to him now to, to get us started. Well, thank you, Jamie. And first of all, let me thank uh, the Foreign Policy Initiative for doing this uh, very important forum. And I certainly want to thank all of our guests uh, for being here uh, with us today. You have, I think, their biographies and um, in your packages, but uh, certainly it's a delight to have uh, Ambassador Rao with us. And Ambassador Rao, just as a highlight, was the first uh, female ambassador to China from India, so has quite a distinguished uh, uh, career, and we're certainly delighted to have you uh, with us as part of this panel. Um, also, um, we have the um, Deputy um, uh, Chief of Mission uh, from the Philippines with us, Maria Australia. And uh, Maria, we thank you for uh, being here and for bringing your expertise. You've got a um, lifetime of career in uh, Foreign Service, and we just thank you for that expertise. And certainly Ambassador Beasley, uh, who joins us, who has uh, served in so many capacities, so many key um, committees when you were actually serving in the parliament there, that you bring a great deal of uh, expertise to this uh, panel. And we hear so many individuals today talking about uh, the Pacific area and the Asia Pacific area and how we should be turning our attention to it. Certainly our administration has had that as their major pivot that they've talked about. And any time that we do that, we quickly come back and say, well, we've got some of the largest populations in the world there, some of the largest economies, some of the largest militaries. Um, as Jamie mentioned, I chair the China Caucus, and when we talk about the Asia-Pacific area, one of the first discussions we always have is about China and what they're doing. But I'd like for you to start off, each of you, to give us your take on some of the key issues and concerns you see in the Asia-Pacific area that might not be directly related to China, because sometimes China kind of overshadows some of the other issues. And, and I think it would be interesting for us to start off with, with your observations of what you think some of the other key issues are going to be over the next several uh, years. So, Ambassador Rao, let's start off with your thoughts, if you could give us uh, those uh, as we open up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to start first as India and how we see the Asia-Pacific region. It's obvious that the center of gravity, all of us would agree, is shifting to that region. And India has always been a part of that region. We have always had a history of engagement with the countries of the Asia-Pacific. It's not just something that began with our sectoral dialogue partnership with the ASEAN in 1992, which then graduated to a full dialogue partnership, which then went further forward to a summit level engagement, and then our entry into the East Asia Summit as of 2005. And we're part of many other forums that, uh, that emanate from the engagement with the Asia Pacific. But for us, in terms of what we have done with the region, first of all, the fact that we have six million persons of Indian origin who live in the Asia-Pacific region. We have three million such people in Myanmar, Burma alone today. And uh, we have about two million in Malaysia. And Indian uh, workers, laborers, entrepreneurs, professionals, traders have all been engaged with this part of the world for, for so, so long. In fact, it's so much a part of the Indian imagination, our engagement with the Asia Pacific. We have novels being serialized in Tamil magazines about the history of our engagement, and very popular too. I mean, they're the stuff that movies are made of, for instance. So um, let me say that today, when we look at our partnership with the Asia Pacific, we are aware of the challenges. We are aware of the need for closer engagement because of the fact that India 
is not just a South Asian country. It's equally, in my view, a Southeast Asian country by virtue of the diversity of our population, the fact that we share frontiers with Southeast Asian countries. In fact, the farthermost islands of India, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, are just a few kilometers away from the Thai waters and the Indonesian waters. So that's the extent of the spread, really, of our, of our interest for as far as this region is concerned. We have free trade agreements today with a number of these countries. We, are, uh, we have welcomed the idea of a regional cooperative economic partnership, which involves the ASEAN countries and the original members uh, of the East Asia Summit. So uh, let me just say, um, you know, when it comes to maritime security, when it comes to anti-piracy, when it comes to preventing the spread of uh, or the proliferation of weapons, just keeping the sea lines of communication open because we are a trading country too. We are one of the world's largest economies today. So we have every reason to stay committed and to be engaged with the region. Well, thank you. Ms. Australia, how about you? Hi. Uh, thank you, Congressman Forbes. Uh, it's a, uh, on behalf of the ambassador, I'd like to convey his apologies for not being able to make it. Uh, we had a tragedy involving some Filipino workers in Louisiana, so he had to fly there. Uh, but he would have wanted to be here, especially because in the past two years, the past few years, we have clearly seen how attention has turned to Asia, not just by partners in North America, but also in Europe, uh, the relations with Asia's relations with the rest of the world have never been as vibrant uh, in recent history. And we're very happy, the Philippines is very happy to be part of that uh, new relations. Uh, in terms of the relations with the U.S., the Philippines welcomes the rebalancing, specifically the bipartisan nature of this commitment and the assurance that uh, for the next four years under the uh, the second term of the of president obama we will see the we will see the policy of the rebalancing to southeast asia be one of the premises of us foreign policy so we very much welcome that at the same time we also believe that there despite the fears raised about the financial situation in the us there is no inherent contradiction between being more engaged internationally specifically in the asia pacific region and consolidating the us power uh, we believe that investing in the stability, security, and prosperity of Asia is a key ingredient which will really help uh, build the U.S. strengthen the U.S. economic recovery. At the same time, we have also noticed that the narrative has changed. In the past, it's, uh, there has been this idea that the U.S. is a major donor to the countries in South, that allies in Southeast Asia, like the Philippines and Thailand. While the U.S. still remains our strongest, our biggest source of uh, foreign military financing, the partners in the region have also stepped up. The, mo the model now is one of shared responsibility. The countries in the region have never been as prepared to take on a bigger share of the responsibility for maintaining the peace and security of the region. In the Philippines, for example, we have spent in the last two years alone more than we have spent in the past 15 years before that in beefing up our external security. Our armed forces have also shifted their uh, attention from uh, their focus from internal security to external defense. So that is a clear manifestation of the desire to take on more responsibility for the security and stability of the region. Uh, so with that, we are looking forward to working closely with our partners with our partners in the EAS, the US, Australia, India, China, among others. And uh, one other point, the strengthening of the engagement with other partners in the region is, should not be taken as, a, as designed to contain any other power. Basically, it's what we would like to do really is to sort of work towards guaranteeing the international order which has underpinned the growth of the region. So uh, we would like to disabuse the idea that the strengthened alliances is an effort to box out or contain any other power. Good. Ambassador? Well, I'd like to do a few statistics, but before I do, I just wanted to say that, uh, in fact, Australia internally represents very much 
the phenomena that the ambassador and the deputy chief of mission were talking about in terms of the the spread, the diaspora, if you like, of uh, of Indian and uh, and Filipino citizens throughout the region. Um, we have a large number of Indian Australians and Filipino Australians. In the days when I was employment minister, I used to note there was one interesting factor about those two communities. There are lots of communities in Australia. We're as multicultural as the United States. The interesting thing about those two communities, zero unemployment. Zero unemployment. And I bet if you looked at the statistics here in uh, the United States, uh, you would find something very similar. I think, I think from the, uh, the, the point of view of a slightly different orientation, which you called for, I think the thing, the, the most notable statistic for the zone that we're talking about here today is the fact that it's going to move over the course of the next 15 years from having about 20% of the globe's middle class to 60% of, uh, of the globe's middle class. This, is, this area is going to be the focal point of the global economy. Nations will thrive and prosper to the degree that they successfully intersect with the Asian Pacific region economically. If they do it well, they'll prosper. If they fail to do it, they'll be on a permanent downward slide. So that's, that's I think, one of the, uh, the first interesting statistics from that. The second is, uh, and I guess it, and I think in a way it's not just proximity, why Australia woke up to this pretty early and, and now delighted that uh, the US is, is we are more exposed. If you look at the Australian uh, domestic, uh, gross product, gross domestic product, about 22% of it and rising is in the internationally traded sector. In the United States, despite the fact that you're the world's biggest exporter, despite the fact that you are the, you were the harbinger of, uh, of global capitalism and multi, multinational capitalism, despite that, only 9% of your uh, GDP is uh, in the globally traded sector. But your growth, your prospects for growth, as you look around now at, at drivers for growth in the US economy, has got to be exports uh, to this zone. So there's a, uh, the US has this going for it. It can be relatively relaxed and considered about the way in which it do things because the, the American economic engine is so gigantic it can actually support uh, most of what Americans aspire to. But uh, you can look at this as a long-term prospect. The third and last thing I'd want to say is this. You are absolutely right not to simply focus on China in this regard. The most interesting thing that we are now witnessing globally is the simultaneous rise of uh, a dozen major powers, rapid rise of a dozen major powers, in a set of circumstances where issues between them are not resolved. Normally speaking, an absolute uh, boilerplate requirement for a rise economically is that all the issues in the particular area have been settled. That you know what your borders are, that uh, there's a sort of rough common agreement on what character of the societies are that you have. All these things have normally been associated with the rise of a particular region, country or zone to, to preeminence. In the Southeast Asian area in particular, there are almost no settled boundaries, almost none. And, uh, and the, as these powers rise, they do what the Deputy Chief of Mission said the Filipinos are doing now, and that is they're switching from a domestic focus to, a, uh, to an external focus in the way in which they plan their security. Well, they're doing that in part because they've got the economy to be able to do it. And, um, most of the countries in the zone now have the economy to be able to do it, but there is no arbiter, there is no uh, guarantor, there is no decider when it comes to how all these issues are going to be resolved. At the same time, these issues are capable of being pursued by other means, given the technological cap capacities of the participants. That's where the US comes in. That's, that's an American opportunity.
Let's <clears throat> follow up with that, Ambassador Beasley. And you've given us projections of what we can be looking at the next 10 years in terms of percentages of middle class. And you looked at the percentages of the United States with um, our uh, trade versus Australia and perhaps India and, and the Philippines. What role do you see for American leadership in this region over the next decade? Well, I, I, I think the first thing is to deepen your understanding of the zone. I actually think, and this is contrary to a lot of people's understanding and argument, the US and China do <laughs> relations between them pretty well. There is, there is the most intense engagement going on between the United States and China of a depth and capacity and breadth that makes us jealous. Uh, we would love to be able to say that we are all knowing in this and that you just need to rely on us for advice and we'll tell you exactly the right thing to do. In fact, you know a hell of a lot more than we do and, and, you're, a, and you're a heck of a lot more uh, engaged than we are. So there is, um, uh, in that area, a, a very substanti a substantial American capacity. Right through the Cold War, the Americans were engaged with North Asia. And there's a, you know, it's a, whatever you might say about tilts and repositionings and the rest of it. United States, Japan, Korea, China, uh, and uh, the issues related to Taiwan in that process have been pretty well understood. You drop the ball in Southeast Asia after Vietnam. Ellsworth Bunker was the last great American statesman to make his reputation from a lifetime's commitment to events that have occurred in the Southeast Asian region. When Nixon declared the Guam Doctrine in 1969, you really did pull out and, uh, and basically left the Southeast Asian and to a certain degree the South Asian area as um, a bit of a dependency of what you did elsewhere, uh, be it what you did in the Middle East or be it what you did in North Asia. So what's required now, that's so the basis of your question, is deep engagement. That's people-to-people -people stuff, it's commercial stuff, it's business, it's academic. You know, when I was a kid in the 1960s, um, the best place to study Southeast Asia was Cornell University. Um, it's still pretty good, but it's nowhere near of the, uh, the class that it was then. And um, so there's a, uh, uh, I, the thing that gives you great encouragement about the approach of the current administration is how they sort of realise that there's an awful lot of catching up they have to do and therefore you have to listen to the perspectives of the people in the area, understand why they think like they do and seek your friends. It's, it's, India is a, is a pretty good friend in this area. The, the cultural spread of India through Southeast Asia is simply massive. And um, it, it goes through in generations after generations. So it's good friends. You've got good dialogue partners for, for Southeast Asia. But the, the critical thing is engagement. And probably two or three decades from now, it will be really quite impressive. Well, Ambassador Rallis, uh, pick up where I'm Ambassador Beasley has just um, left off We're talking about the friendship we have with India. And it is a little different relationship. We don't have a treaty alliance like we do with the Philippines and with Australia. What role do you see in terms of American leadership and, and how cooperative uh, should India be with the United States and vice versa? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, the relationship between India and the United States has come to be defined as a strategic partnership today. And in fact, President Obama referred to it, I think, quite appropriately as an indispensable partnership. So we combine uh, both principles and pragmatism in this mix, you know, when it comes to relations between India and the United States. We've had a history, let's say, of, of some distancing between the two countries for whatever reasons during the Cold War era and a little after that. But in the last decade or so, the relationship has substantially improved. And today it's a multi-dimensional partnership. It's not just about political dialogue between leaders, but it's a very strong and thriving trade and business relationship. Of course, we have three million Indian Americans in this country today. And uh, we are, uh, our defense establishments engage with each other very closely. In fact, 
we do more military exercises with the United States than we do with any other country today. And apart from that, we have, there are numerous dialogue mechanisms on education, on health, on agriculture, on energy. The, you know, it's become a very full, fully evolved, let me say, partnership today. When you look at the region and we, when the United States talks about its pivot to Asia, what we in India have always regarded is the fact that the United States has, is, has been and is and will be a Pacific power. You know, the level of its engagement with uh, Northeast Asia, with East Asia, has always been substantial in the post-World World War II era. And you have, as Ambassador Beasley said, a very, very substantive and evolved relationship with China. Now, when it comes to China, China is a neighbor of India's. We have a very long border with China. We are immediately contiguous to each other. And uh, we have uh, unresolved questions in our relationship with China. For instance, the border question, as you know, is not as yet settled. But what we've been able to achieve with China, and this, I think, also affects our perspective when it comes to uh, the evolving Asia-Pacific situation. With China, we have built a relationship in which we've been able to manage our differences in a very rational and grown-up way. We have, for instance, a mechanism to negotiate a settlement off the border between special representatives appointed by the leaders of the two countries. We have a thriving trade relationship. In fact, China has become India's largest trading partner in goods today. And just yesterday, for instance, when we had another round of our strategic economic dialogue with China in Beijing, we signed agreements and understandings worth about 5.3 billion US dollars in terms of investments, two-way investments between the two countries. So as uh, my colleague from the Philippines just said, you know, we are not looking at, at isolating China in, in this whole narrative of building better relations with the Asia Pacific. We see the need to engage China. We, need the, uh, we see the need to develop more and more habits of cooperation with China. But when it comes to a security architecture for the Asia Pacific, we also believe that it must be open and inclusive and rule-based, of course, and that um, we should strengthen dialogue rather than, you know, see confrontation escalating for whatever reason. When you look at the leadership of the United States and whatever that might be in that role as it um, continues to evolve over the next decade, certainly you could spend a large part of today talking about all the cooperation between India and the United States. Do you see any limits on that cooperation? If you had to take the opposite side and say, where do you draw the line on the limits of that cooperation, how would you describe those boundaries, if any? You know, I would approach that uh, question from, uh, from where we are situated as a country. Now, India lives in a very complex neighborhood. And apart from that, you know, we have challenges. We have, of course, great opportunities also when it comes to our own development and our own emergence as one of the world's leading economies. But our concentration at this moment is really on how to see our development story move forward. We have work to do in that regard. And in order to complete that work success successfully, we need a very peaceful and uh, you know, stable neighborhood. And that is why we have, as I just mentioned in the case of China, and I'd also add the example of what we're doing with Pakistan today. We're trying to resolve issues through dialogue and through negotiation. Very, very complex, very involved history to some of these issues. But we're determined that it's only through settling these issues and normalizing relations in the neighborhood that we can advance. So when it comes to the United States, when it comes to countries like the United States, the United States will always be a very important and key partner for India. And there are, I just you know, referred to the many reasons why you know, we are good partners. Uh, there, is a, there is a certain, you know, impulse to this relationship. There's a certain 
logic to better relations with the United States. And as you mentioned, uh, the fact that there is a bipartisan approach here in the United States to building better relations with Asia, I see that in the bipartisan approach here in the, in the Congress, for instance, to building better relations with India. You have the largest country caucus for any country outside the United States in the US Congress for India. The India caucus is the largest caucus when it comes to country-based caucuses in the both houses of Congress. So there are no limits really to this relationship, but I see this as a gradually evolving process. You know, uh, in India we have to do things our way. You know, the way we do it is through exploring the opportunities to build relations with a number of countries because it suits India. It is in India's interest. After all, foreign policy is dictated by your national interest. But the United States, the relationship with the United States is a key bilateral relationship for India. And it's a relationship on which we spend a lot of time and we devote a lot of attention. And it occupies the popular imagination in India also in a way that I don't believe relations with any other country do. Ms. Australia, you talked a little bit about defense budgets in the Philippines and how you've been um, concentrating of late on some of the um, external defense uh, capabilities. But you have had to focus a lot of your defense dollars internally um, in the past. Um, how do you plan to continue to do what you need externally when you still have a lot of those uh, domestic needs? And then secondly, uh, do you have any concern as you look at uh, uh, decreasing defense dollars in the United States, cuts that have taken place, and the possibility of sequestration. And does that uh, send any message to you that's concerning at all? Uh uh, thank you for that question, uh, because it gives me an opportunity to inform that just recently we signed a breakthrough framework agreement with the biggest insurgent group, uh, uh, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. That has, this has been decades in the making. So uh, we signed this framework agreement, which is just the beginning of what we would like to do. But it's also a very clear manifestation of the gains accomplished by the government of President Aquino into putting into place a just and enduring peace, especially in southern Philippines, which has, as you mentioned in the past, really eaten up a lot of our defense dollars. Uh, with this development and with this strides we have taken in counter-insurgent, in counter-terrorism, we are able to successfully transition uh, the attention of our armed forces and pass over the responsibility for our internal defense to the Philippine National Police. Uh, this has been part of what we aim to do under the Defense Modernization Program, and we are at the point when we're slowly reaping the gains of these long-term programs. Of course, the, sec the threat of sequestration is giving us nightmares, considering that the U.S. remains our biggest source of foreign military financing. But we're taking heart in the commitment made by uh, the administration of President Obama that despite all of these, Asia-Pacific, not just the Philippines, remains a top priority. In fact, despite all this talk, uh, Secretary Panetta has just reaffirmed that by 20, 20 60 percent of the naval assets of uh, the U.S. will be in the Asia-Pacific region. So we believe that while it is a cause for serious concern, the commitment of the U.S. government to remain focused on the region is of great comfort to us. And another thing I'd like to pick up on what Ambassador Beasley said about the fact that uh, in the past, uh, Southeast Asia has been sort of marginalized. We also are heartened by what we see now as a sort of refocusing internally within Asia from the attention given to Northeast Asia. In the past, there was the perception that the U.S. policy on Asia was largely focused on the Northeast Asian allies and partners, but not so much attention to East Asia. Uh, we now see very cl a very clear trend of Southeast Asia being given importance. Like for one, just three years ago, I could hardly imagine President Obama talking to the leader of Myanmar. And he just completed a very successful visit. So clearly, uh, there is great political will 
to engage deeply in Southeast Asia, not just in Southeast Asia bilaterally, but also in the institutions of Southeast Asia, like the East, ASEAN, the East Asia Summit, for one, which has been a very useful mechanism for uh, dialogue at the highest level on issues of strategic importance. Ambassador Beasley, I saw you get all jittery and nervous when that question came up because I know you want to get into the one on sequestration and defense spending. But that Rhodes Scholar kind of comes back in you with your statistics. But, you know, one of the statistics that concern us a little bit is Australia's um, reduction in defense dollars. Uh, now you're at probably, I think, percentage-wise to gross national product, probably we're you maybe the lowest since maybe 1938, according to one statistic. Um, the question I'd have for you is this. Do you perceive that as sending any kind of message or um, signal that could be misconstrued as to Australia's commitment to security issues? And secondly, what, if any, concerns do you have about U.S. defense cuts and possible sequestration? And what message, if any, is that... Um, uh, how is that being perceived in Australia? Well, I, I think firstly uh, what you indicate, and for many other reasons as well, when people ask me how do I approach the issue of sequestration and uh, its impact on the defence vote here in the United States, the defence budget here in the United States, I always say I approach it humbly. Because the truth of the matter is that when it looks, if you look globally, um, at the, uh, the taxpayers' burden on defence, and the term Australia sort of uh, is uh, is a is a chap racing with a uh, no more handicap weight wise than a baton, and the American taxpayer is on board devil with a hundred pound pack on his back, going up a sheer cliff. But uh, it's a, uh, a burden that is massive in the United States, and uh, we are not entitled, any of us to lecture the United States on defence spending. You carry much more of a burden than the rest of us. The, whatever our budget cuts are, however, it will not stop us being your fourth biggest arms uh, 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 customer. Uh, and it will not stop us buying an entire air force from the United States uh, over the course of the, of the next little while. Um, it's been uh, dollars well spent because of certain acquisitions with which you've been very generous technologically. Most recently, the Growler system, which we're just acquiring from the US for a couple of billion, which is, um, I think, we're the only other country operating that. And, uh, and so there's a, it's still whatever the level it allows a, a considerable effort. I will say this, and it's, a, and it's a slightly lengthy, but not too lengthy way of answering it. You, the different, we, we spend about what the Europeans do on average, and that's a source of American concern as well. But the difference is this. Uh, if you look at the national government share in Europe of GDP, it's about 35 to 55, depending where you are. We are the same as you. Uh, we are at the national government level at 25% of GDP. And so your uh, three and a half to four, compared to our one and a half, uh, comes off the same amount, if you like, of, of national effort, GDP, 25. With your 25, you're, you're, you're keeping going a, uh, a, a, a pretty, pretty substantial social security system, health care and uh, health care entitlements. And when you move beyond that, you're pretty well into defence. In Australia, we do this. We support the virtually entirety of the private education system, private schools. They educate 30% of young Australians basically funded by the national government. We support all the Australian universities. Basically, all the Australian universities are funded by the national government. We support the lion's share of all the public hospitals. Uh, the public hospitals are not exclusively funded by the Australian government massively. We support universal health care uh, from, uh, from that budget. We support the Australian pension system and unemployment system. Uh, from that national budget. And uh, this, uh, and we have to fit all of that into 25%. Well, of course, we do that by massive means testing of social payments. And, you know, large numbers of Australians receive no social security payments at all because they're means tested out of the system. So we have ruthless means testing, but the functions that we have to carry are vastly greater 
than the functions that are carried by the national government of the United States. And, uh, and it's a problem for people like myself who've always advocated pushing up the defence dollar in Australia. Is you, you, you're, not, you're fighting everybody. As you're, you're fighting the Catholic school system, you're fighting the Muslim school system, you're fighting the Jewish school system, you're fighting all the universities, you're fighting all the public hospitals, you're fighting virtually everybody with a requirement for federal help if you try to lift that, uh, that percentage up. Plus, we have, we're not like the United States. You are, you are the national reserve currency. Everybody turns their face to the US. We run a budget deficit and we're dead. And uh, therefore, we have to run balanced budgets at the same time as we're doing all of that. Ambassador Ralph, you looked over the next 10 years we'll have issues that come and go in the Asia-Pacific area. What would be the top two issues that you think will demand our eyes be focused on over this next decade? Again, I would answer that question from India's perspective. I would say for a country as large as India, and I believe this would apply to any developing or emerging economy, it would be infrastructure and energy for us as we carry our development story forward. You know, India's requirements in terms of infrastructure development are going to be around one trillion US dollars for the next five to six years. That's the extent of commitment that the government of India will need to give to that sector. Plus, of course, uh, we are inviting investment from abroad, from the United States, from our other large uh, foreign uh, partners. So, and energy, because a country of 1.2 billion people, like India, and most of our energy requirements cannot be met from within the country. We have to import from outside. The supply of Iranian oil, of course, is now severely constrained, and uh, we have cut down our imports from Iran. So we are looking to diversify those imports, and we have, in fact, done that over the last year. Now, in the context of what the United States uh, has been able to achieve in terms of its shale gas discoveries, this is one area where we have tried to, um, to uh, focus in our dialogue with the United States about what our requirements would be when you start exporting shale gas uh, to other countries. Right now, you have restricted it just to FTA countries, but India is one of the, the countries knocking on your door when it comes to uh, you know, our interest in being able to access those imports. So energy and infrastructure, and I would add education to that also as a third because millions of uh, young people, our demographic is basically a young demographic. We have about 60 to 65 percent of our population of 1.2 billion people under the age of 25. And they're in school today, many of the young people in school today, what happens to them in a few years from now? What is the kind of higher education you can provide to them? What is the kind of technical and vocational education infrastructure that you can build up. So the education partnership with the United States has become very important. And when you look at our engagement with ASEAN, and when we talk of connectivity, we talk of geographical connectivity, we need better connectivity with Southeast Asia. So one of the areas of focus for us in our dialogue with ASEAN is to build that connectivity from India through Myanmar to Thailand and Vietnam and beyond. And then institutional level connectivity, just with universities, with think tanks, with other you know, non-governmental institutions apart from governments. And finally, people-to-people -people connectivity, I think, which is, which is really the heartbeat of any relationship. So this is just to give you a picture of what our priorities are. And then, of course, counterterrorism and, and security, because we're all threatened by those forces. And the counterterrorism initiative and the homeland security dialogue between India and the United States has come to occupy a very important place in our dialogue today. And so too with other countries of the region. 
you know, the Philippines and India are one of the uh, two of the countries that contribute the largest amount of sailors to merchant marines mm. around the world. So we are threatened by piracy. We have many, many of our sailors in the hands of Somali pirates today. So it's become a huge issue domestically. Because how do you tackle piracy? I mean, how do you tackle the issue of ransoms? How do you tackle the issue of hostage taking? What is the multilateral effort that you can launch to, to prevent this and to, and to eliminate the scourge? So, you know, there is not just one or two issues that are of priority to our countries. There are many. And, that, and, the, and the bottom line to all this is closer cooperation and greater engagement. And so let's try, as we listen to a lot of our viewers, to our viewers that are listening to this and people watching this forum today, they are concerned about the U.S. role and what that might be in the Asia-Pacific area, not just now, but through the next 10 years. If you had a crystal ball and you could forecast and look at, where do you see the United States in terms both um, economically and militarily 10 years from now in terms of its role? Do you see it essentially the same? Do you see it decreasing or do you see it increasing? Well, uh, as Ambassador Rao said, the um, U.S. has always and will always remain to be a Pacific power. So 10 years, 20 years down the line, we see the U.S. as an integral part of the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, and that means more integrated into the Asia-Pacific region economically, uh, security-wise, and strategically. Uh, one thing that I, we are seeing more is the U.S. getting more engaged. And we'd like to continue encouraging the U.S. to engage in the peaceful settlement of disputes, in, uh, not just in the South China Sea, in the West Philippine Sea, but also in the East Sea, because we see those as one of the bigger threats to the stability of the region. And it is not just a concern for us in the region, but also a concern to practically everyone who uses that, that main channel of uh, trade and navigation. So 10, 20 years down the line, we look forward to having more closer, to seeing a more engaged uh, US, not just at, not just on the political level, but also at the institutional level. So we welcome the moves being taken to institutionalize the partnerships. Like with the Philippines, we began the annual ministerial dialogue. We also have a dialogue at the sub-ministerial level. With Indonesia, you are on the third year of an annual comprehensive partnership dialogue. We have an annual dialogue with Australia in the context of the OSMIN. So this institutionalization of the partnerships is something that will cement the presence of the presence and the engagement of the U.S. 10 or 20 years down the line. Okay, um, Ambassador Beasley, um, I know you don't mind taking a strong position on any of these issues, and we appreciate them. We want, want to hear that concept, but we know the U.S. is going to have a major role in Asia. No question about that. I think all of us would agree with that. But if we had to peg it, is it going to be about the same role militarily and economically? Is it going to be less or greater? Which would you pick? Well, I, I know we're asking you to forecast, <laughs> but you're good at that. No, I'm not. But um, I, uh, I'd, have, I'd have done better in Australian politics if I was. But the, uh, can I, uh, look, I, I think that uh, the American engagement has to be intense. And it's not simply because uh, you, you exercise choices about where you put your security commitments and whether you're going to play as an intense a global role in the future as you have in the past. Th these are important. They'll be part of your debate and probably because it's so heavily bound up in expenditures on national security matters in Congress, a heavy part of uh, your debate. But the reality will be this. The United States is going to be the dominant economy in the world for a very long period of time. There is so much pressure inside the American economy to engage with the region. The region still prospers basically because the United States is the grand importer of last resort in, uh, in the global economy. Um, even when you look at the statistics for Southeast Asia now, for example, of, of the bulk of the exports of theirs going to China, they go to China uh, largely is bits and pieces of, pe of machines which are assembled in China and it's exported guess where. And uh, so, so it, it, even, even the, those export statistics 
are, um, uh, are in a sense uh, misleading. Uh, we power the Chinese economy. The Chinese get 50 or 60 per cent of their iron ore from Australia. They're getting, uh, the, we are their largest uh, exporter in coal and uh, will be soon in natural gas. What are they powering? They're, uh, they're powering a, a, a set of uh, 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 production which ends up in the United States. So the United States is already a, the sort of focal point of, uh, of the movements in the Asian economy. It's going to get to be more so. There's going to be deeper and deeper engagement. It's not just going to be with China. There are a lot of other countries that are easier to invest in than China. Um, in the, uh, the Southeast Asian, South Asian area. And uh, so I would say the, the United States is the global power. It will be, it's there to stay. The, the global power always has to engage with the focal point of the global economy. The focal point of the global economy is going to be Southeast Asia. What will hasten that? Uh, I think you're going to see a decline. If I'm going to predict one thing, you're going to see a decline in American interest in the Middle East over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, you are already in the midst of an American energy uh, revolution. Your manufacturing industry is already competitive again because you sell yourself natural gas to power it at one-fifth the price Australia sells natural gas to China. And uh, you are going to be energy independent. Wonderful. In 10 years, all this talk about Saudi America, that's right. As that flows through, you're going to find yourself less and less engaged with the Middle East, I would predict, more and more engaged with Asia. We've got a few questions from, uh, that have been Twittered in for us to uh, respond to. And Ambassador Rao, I'm going to give you the first one and then let you make whatever comment you'd like on that. But the uh, question that came is, what's the best way to resolve the issue of new Chinese passports that claim Indian territory? <laughs> And if you could address that and then respond if you wanted to to Ambassador Beasley. Well, this is a question that our national security advisor was asked just tw less than 24 hours ago in Delhi. So it's a question that occupies, you know, the public space a great deal today. Well, I would, you know, having dealt with the issue for some decades now, uh, this is not going to go away overnight. You know, there are, as I said at the outset, unresolved questions between India and China. There is a way they look at the representation of their boundaries with other countries, including India. And there is our, you know, considered view of where our frontiers lie to. So there is a space between us, uh, you know, uh, on which uh, there is no common ground on, on this particular issue. I look at it this way. Uh, you know, we recognize the fact that there are differences between our two countries on these issues. Now, how do we go about it? Our um, former prime minister, the late Mrs. Indira Gandhi, once very rightly said, you cannot march to Peking. You know, you obviously have to sit down and discuss these issues and see how you can build some common ground and, and uh, find a mutually acceptable way to resolve this. And that's the approach that India has taken. And uh, when we speak to the Chinese leadership, this is what they tell us to. So this, uh, you know, this uh, shadow play between the two countries is bound to continue until and unless we have a final and comprehensive settlement of the issue. But we have, it's important to understand, maintained peace and tranquility on the borders between India and China for more than four decades now. Not a single shot has been fired on that boundary, on that border, in the, on, along those frontiers for all these years. So there are mechanisms to uh, maintain peace and tranquility and to build confidence between the defense establishments of the two countries. In fact, the defense minister of China, General Liang Kuangli, was in India just a little over a month ago. So, you know, we have a certain ecosystem in which we we transact dialogue and business between the two countries so that sustains the process and uh, while these uh, while the process is ongoing these differences will surface from time to time but we have to learn to manage these differences okay. ambassador beasley one of um 
listeners uh, would like to ask your um, thoughts on the current fluctuating Chinese mineral demand and the effect it's having on Australia. Uh, well, the, the Australian uh, Chinese or the the development of the Australian minerals and, and energy provinces has sort of moved through from the the phase of uh, you know changes in prices which have enabled there to be uh, agreements reached and have allowed mines to develop through to the construction phase through to the production phase. Virtually all the mines which are now underway or in construction have got their um, their production for a substantial period of time already settled. And basically the prices associated with that already settled. Um, we don't respond to, they don't respond heavily to shifts in spot prices. They, uh, they're basically much more part of a, uh, a long-term investment program backed by a substantial number of uh, contracts. Has to be said that uh, most of the companies that I'm talking about have got a substantial American component to them. Um, ConocoPhillips, at the end of this investment phase, will be have 60% of its global, including American production, basically in Australia. Uh, Chevron is uh, is headed uh, much the same way. Uh, American investment in Australia, I might say, and uh, of which uh, this is part, is 25 times the size of Chinese investment in Australia, just as our investment in the United States is 25 times the size of Chinese uh, of. Uh, uh, our investment in China. In fact, I think our investment in the United States is larger than China's investment in the United States, just to get things in perspective here. Um, our minerals industry, powerful and large though it is, employs about 2% of Australians. The, uh, the bulk of uh, Australians are employed in the service sector and in the eastern states where there's not much, a huge amount of mining activity, some coal, and, um, and, uh, and, and manufacturing industry in Australia is in that, uh, in that zone as well. So, my answer is not helpful, but not laden with crisis. Okay. Um, so, Australia, um, could you tell us if you see the Trans-Pacific Partnership having a major impact in future regional relations? For, in terms of ASEAN, four of our members are already engaged in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, the Philippines and Thailand have expressed strong interest in uh, looking at the Trans-Pacific Partnership, where we see it as a good sign of the continuing U.S. interest in building in the regional integration of the Asia-Pacific region, uh, except that there are very ASEAN, for one, is in very various stages of development. So it's not something that we see happening shortly, but uh, it's something that we will all aspire to. So in a sense, it's very helpful for the regional uh, economic integration, uh, but it may take some time and it will take a lot of effort and calibration on the part of the participants. Last question I'd like to throw out to you is, um, and Ambassador Rao, you, you mentioned the uh, terrorism aspect and counter-terrorism um, efforts that we could undergo. Um, how do you view um, terrorism over the next decade? What are our major challenges going to be there? What can we do cooperatively, do you believe, to, to help stem that tide? I think we have already established good patterns of cooperation when it comes to dealing with terrorism and strengthening counter-terrorism cooperation. I think we have to be especially vigilant to uh, what we, in our region, would call cross-border terrorism. But there's the larger aspect of transnational terrorism, because uh, terror groups, uh, you know, there are very thin cell walls that s separate terror groups. So uh, you have you have a 
Lashkar-e Taiba, which is closely connected with other terror groups, including the Taliban, or you know, the, 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 there are connections with with the international groups like Al Qaeda. So we have, I believe, in the next ten years or so, this is not a problem that is going to fade away. It is going to be something that is going to loom very large in our consciousness and in our planning, strategic planning, when it comes to safeguarding homeland security and when it comes to ensuring that we do not have attacks, for instance, of the sort that happened in Mumbai. It's exactly four years ago, as of yesterday, that the attacks on Mumbai happened. And we still haven't had, you know, a final judgment on those responsible for instigating, planning, executing those attacks. So there is the question also of money laundering, of counterfeit currency, on all these issues. You know, terror groups use these mechanisms. They use these ways to, to spread and to, to enhance their resources and to be able to spread their activities across borders. So if we look at a country like India, you know, our borders, we have many neighbors around us. And uh, many of these borders are borders across which such things happen where you have counterfeit currency coming in, where you have money laundering, where you have uh, groups flying in uh, to our uh, cities through other countries. So the question of, uh, you know, I think it was Thomas Jefferson who said that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. I think we will have to be constantly vigilant. Mm -hmm. So Australia, any thoughts on terrorism? Well. Uh, Terrorism very much affects the Philippines, similar to the experience of India. And we are very appreciative of the cooperative efforts we have had with the U.S. in addressing this problem uh, to the extent that, as I mentioned earlier, we are now able to sort of move on from the heavier emphasis we did, uh, we had on, on the problem. But at the same time, it is also something that we cannot neglect at all. In the case of the Philippines, Ambassador Rao also mentioned earlier that uh, piracy, which is uh, another of the transnational crimes, affects so many Filipinos. Uh, one out of every four seafarers come from the Philippines. So that to us is uh, a, another pressing concern that we are working with the international community to address in the context of the contact group of piracy. But we believe in that effort, more work needs to be done. We still have close to 100 uh, Filipino seafarers in the hands of Somali pirates. And it's a very heavy lift to address this issue for the Philippines. Okay. We've got time for two or three questions from the audience. And we have some interns with some microphones if um, we have any questions. I think one all the way in the back, if we have a microphone that can get there. Edward Ruder from Sunshine Press. This is mostly for Ambassador Rao, but anyone else can chime in. Over the past third of a century, American elections have increasingly involved much more money per voter each year than in the past. This appears likely to continue. When it comes to foreign policy, Pro-Israel PACs contribute more to Senate campaigns than PACs of all other nationalistic causes combined, and even in Senate campaigns, more than all liberal causes and all conservative causes combined. Are there any, and, and this one presumes has had an effect on our policy toward the Middle East, unless you think the donors are fools. The Philippines have only a very small American PAC, uh, Philippine Physicians Association. And India has almost no presence in financing American elections, Indian Americans. Are there any plans to become involved in American politics or to get Indian Americans involved in American politics through money, as has been done apparently to some success? by pro-Israeli Americans. 
And, and Ambassador, this will require all your diplomatic skills and how you <laughs> answer that, but uh, please have at it. <laughs> I thought all the Indian Americans got directly elected. <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, let me say I'm Indian. I'm not Indian American. And that would be a question that would be better answered by an Indian American. But I wanted to say that I, like many other of my ambassadorial colleagues, did go to the uh, Republican and Democratic National Conventions. And uh, what was remarkable was that I saw a number of Indian Americans uh, who were, you know, donors to the campaigns in both these locations. So uh, with the uh, rise in the profile of the Indian American community and the fact that they are a very prosperous lot of people, I think they are increasingly engaged with American politics and uh, both on the Democratic and Republican, Republican side. And you see the numbers of Indian Americans in politics today. We have two Indian American governors, uh, Republican governors in Louisiana and South Carolina, Governor Jindal and Governor Haley. We have an Indian American who was just elected to the House of Representatives from California, Dr. Ami Bera. So a number of other Indian Americans who are in, who are in state level legislatures and who have been running for uh, office, uh, many pub, uh, lots of uh, public office related responsibilities. So the profile of Indian Americans and their involvement in American politics is growing and I visualize that as being an upward rising graph in the years to come. Good. Yes, I have a question all the way in the back, if we could get a microphone. Hello, um, Catherine Fitzpatrick. I write on uh, Central Asian Affairs. I had a question for Ambassador Rao. Um, one of the big hopes for post-war reconstruction in Afghanistan has been the Tappy pipeline out of Turkmenistan, and that seems to have stalled in the, this last quarter, and whether it's issues of security or pricing. I wonder if you have any comment on, on the immediate and long-term prospects for that pipeline and the concept of a pipeline in general as being something that can be used for, for, for prosperity for countries or whether itself would be a conflict generator. Thank you. We don't see it as, as a conflict generator. We see it as enhancing our access to energy. I just referred to the, to the fact of India's requirements of energy, and most of it has to come from abroad. So we are very, very enthusiastic participants in the TAPI pipeline negotiations. So we would like them to move forward. Okay. Any other questions that anyone has? One last question, right back here. Ken Meyercourt, uh, World Docs. Um, is India concerned that our placing our relations with the Indian Navy under the Pacific Command instead of the Central Command as uh, India would like? Uh, does that raise any concern that, that we might be seeing our alliance with, military alliance with India as part of our effort to contain ch uh, China rather than uh, securing uh, supplies of oil from the Persian Gulf for fighting piracy? I I don't believe we see it that way. I, all across the board, we have good relations with the American military, whether it's the, the Army, the Navy, or the Air Force. And it's not a question of which command we're dealing with. It's the substance of that cooperation. And the, uh, India and the United States, apart from sharing democratic values, uh, I would also like to add that we have convergent interests when it comes to peace and security in our region. And that is why we are exercising much and more, more and more with the American Navy. We are engaged in anti-piracy operations, as I mentioned, the security of sea lanes of communication, the preventing the spread of uh, weapons, and just, just engaging more closely with each other because of these convergent interests. So I think that time has passed when, you know, there were, you know, these points of divergence between our two countries. There is increasing convergence when it comes to security. And I wanted to mention, you know, when we talk of the Asia Pacific, I think the term that is increasingly being used is the India Pacific. Indo -Pacific it's the yeah. Indo Pacific. In fact, the, you know, something that has perhaps not been much reported here is the fact that the United States has just been admitted as an observer to the Indian Ocean 
Nations Rim Association for Regional Cooperation just in the last few weeks. So there is this much closer coming together of the Indian Ocean region and the Asia Pacific region. So whatever command deals with it, I think the interests are shared between our two countries. We'll have one final question then. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Flavius Mihaias. Um, um, questions to Ambassador Rayo. In the context of the UNFCCC um, COP18 uh, meetings and uh, three years down the road um, uh, since the um, uh, Energy and Climate Change uh, Partnership Agreement between India and the US, where does this partnership stand? And are we um, moving toward a, perhaps a common position on those um, global climate change negotiation issues? Thank you. You know, I think you have to uh, look at this from two angles. One, of course, is the UNFCC uh, discussions and uh, our global climate change uh, related interaction. That's a larger issue. But there is a bilateral story, a bilateral side to all of this, and uh, that has reference to the energy partnership between India and the US. In the last two to three years, that cooperation has intensified. I refer to the fact that we have an energy dialogue. It's a dialogue that focuses on renewable energy. It's a dialogue that focuses on uh, second generation biofuels. It's a dialogue that focuses on energy efficiency for buildings. We have a regional center for clean energy research and development between India and the United States in operation today with funding provided by by both countries and we've announced several research projects involving universities and research institutions in both countries to look at energy related issues particularly clean energy and the research we can do in that area so that you know we can bring affordable but green energy uh, to consumers in both countries so this has become a huge area for cooperation between the two countries and i visualize it growing as far as the multilateral larger ambit of discussion goes, of course, you know, the United States and India have engaged very closely with each other when, it, when you look at the global climate change negotiations. We look, in India look at it from the point of view of sustainable development. We are concerned about uh, low carbon growth. We are definitely not a, a large emitter of green gases. And we would like that level to go down even further. And that is why we are concentrating on green energy research and development. Well, on behalf of the Foreign Policy Initiative, let me thank each of our panelists. If, in fact, all eyes have been on Asia, they've all been on you uh, this morning. And we thank you for, one, the service to your countries, but also your friendship with the United States. And thanks so much for your uh, help and guidance today. Thank you.